Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, another compelling story on land conservation in the Gulf states, and it's all to better our communities. In Southern Gardening, a double feature that starts with Repeat After Me, we'll explain. Plus an encore presentation, Miss Peyton Bell, a young lady who lights up the ring. And the conclusion of our conservation story, a new model for clean growth. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Today another story on a subject dear to the hearts of many around the country, land conservation. We visit Diamond Head, Mississippi, built in a watershed, where an emphasis on low impact expansion preserves both land and water quality. We begin by meeting the man who runs Diamond Head. My name is Michael Riso. I'm the city manager for Diamond Head, Mississippi. I've been in this position for just over two years. I'm hired by the city council uh, to manage and administer the city. So all the staff, all the employees of the city all uh, answer to me. So public works, to the streets, to drainage, uh, that all falls under my responsibility. It's always a challenge. Um, I think based on my uh, experience from previous jobs, I'll be able to bring that knowledge into this workplace uh, to better our community. Diamond Head was formed in 1970, um, really as a resort community, and it's grown since drastically. It's 12 miles square, we got 82 miles of streets. Diamond Head's really a unique community along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Primarily, it's a residential community. We don't have industry here. The south port of Diamond Head is located on uh, the Bay of St. Louis. So the bay feeds right into the Gulf of Mexico. So the waters from the Gulf are coming right up to Diamond Head. If I think of a, probably a major threat to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, obviously we think of hurricanes and the weather, okay, because we've lived it. But to be honest, the water quality is probably one of the biggest things that are threatening the Mississippi Gulf Coast. One of the things we're starting to experience is um, areas that are undeveloped now are, are starting to flood where they didn't flood before. As climate change occurs, we are actually going to see more and more increased flooding, more and more intensive heat, because hotter air actually holds more moisture. And so what happens is we're going to have more intense storms, increased uh, rainfall, and those kinds of, of impacts. When you think of a watershed-based approach to either flood management or water quality, you've got to look upstream. You've got to say, where is the water where it is starting, and how is it coming down and impacting the people more south of it, let's call it. Upstream areas are just as important, if not more important, in terms of managing the impacts on our waterways. Everything that people do on their individual properties and where and how things get built impacts the, the water quantity and what happens, what ends up in our waterways downstream. Instead of reserving one place that's outside an urban area for stormwater and expecting to move all the water there and detain it and retain it there, it's more important to break it down into multiple places, smaller pockets of land inside the urban core that then become the infiltration zones for stormwater to, to resist. And so land conservation can provide those areas that really make great places for stormwater to be detained very close to where it falls. I think Hancock County 
with the countywide stormwater, you know, looking at the watershed approach to drainage and water quality is unique. That, that is definitely something we could be on the cutting edge um, and be one of the only counties that have done it in the state. Yeah, when you talk about land conservation, I think it's very important uh, for a variety of reasons. I think of Diamond Head, I think of some areas that are, uh, may, might be wetlands, so we want to prevent maybe development in that area uh, that is prone to flooding. But it's also an area that's cleaning the water and it's serving multiple purposes, including for our wildlife and our fisheries. So it's important for us to make sure we're taking care of that. We'll conclude to better our community, originally part two of a three-part conservation series later in the show. What do they say? Repetition is the mother of learning. Agriculturist Gary Bachman says that also works in the garden. It's a design strategy that makes gardening easier. Here's Gary with an explanation and the DIY. Today, Southern Gardening is visiting our friend Catherine in her pleasant and pretty landscape. The focal point of her front landscape is the lace-leaf Japanese maple, known botanically as Acer palmatum dissectum. This is a special tree for Catherine because it was moved from Atlanta when Catherine moved to the Mississippi coast. The newly emerging fine textured foliage is a gorgeous reddish maroon and displayed on highly decorative contorted branches. Catherine also uses a powerful and easy landscape technique, repetition, utilizing only three plants, supertunia, coleus, and caladium. Vista bubblegum supertunia is perhaps my favorite petunia to grow. It was selected as both a Mississippi medallion winner and Louisiana super plant. This petunia produces loads of bright pink flowers. This is one of the most vigorous selections, growing greater than three foot by three foot. A fully grown Vista bubblegum supertunia can be truly stunning. Gaze Delight coleus are lime green with striking maroon veins. The lime green is a unique accent color that gets my attention. This sun or shade selection will eventually grow to 24 inches tall and 16 inches wide. White Wonder Caladium is part shade to full sun tolerant. These have white lance-shaped leaves with a distinctive green edge. The deep magenta center veins add a spark of color. Repeating colors in plants can have your landscape looking pretty as a picture. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. In Southern Gardening today, a bonus segment. You've heard this before. Good things come in small packages. Well, often that's nowhere more true than in the landscape, where tiny flowers can group together to form a stunning display. Here's Gary Bachman with the perfect demonstration of strength in numbers. with tiny flowers are outstanding additions for your garden and landscape. Let's take a look at a few great choices to consider. Butterfly Bush displays up to 12 inch fragrant panicles of mass tiny flowers in various shades of color. The tiny flowers are produced on arching graceful stems that butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds love. One of my favorites is Flutterby Petite Tutti Frutti Pink which has seven to eight inch panicles of fuchsia red flowers. Serena angelonia are commonly called summer snapdragons and were selected a Mississippi medallion winner in 2007. This plant has flower stalks really packed with tiny flowers and are welcome additions to any summer garden. Flower colors include blues, pinks, violets, and white. Vitex, a 2002 Mississippi medallion winner has flowers called panicles that are composed of many clusters of small individual tiny flowers. I love the color of the beautiful flowering display. Ranging from brilliant blue to bluish lavender, 
the panicles can have a cloud-like appearance in the landscape. Amaranth is considered an ancient grain, with its tiny bloom-packed flower heads producing seeds that can be ground into flour. Elephant head has huge reddish-purple flower heads. Hopi red dye amaranth was used to make dye by the southwestern Hopi Indian nation. These flowers may be tiny, but there's strength in numbers that create landscape impact. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join me next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but stick around. Coming up, we conclude to better our community, part two of our original series on land conservation in the Gulf States. We'll talk again to Michael Riso, who manages the resort community of Diamond Head, Mississippi. There, he and others work carefully with developers to ensure a low-impact, conservation-centric approach with an emphasis on water purity. It can be a delicate balance. Don't go away. We'll be right back. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education of which extension work is an essential part is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy and that people when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. No question, 4-H is a time of happy memories for many of our country's kids. For one young lady, though, it was also a time of extraordinary growth. From one of the many extensions in the U.S., this one at Mississippi State University, and from producer Brian Utley, here's a special story of just why extension matters. Peyton Bell is outstanding. She's dedicated, she's hardworking, and she just has the brightest personality. That's what the judges always comment about her. They was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't see you until you smiled. And, she, and once she smiles, she, she has your attention. Everybody at the show to love her and they cheer for her. And, and when she win, everybody uh, cheering. So we're very, very proud of her. I enjoy seeing these kids grow into this and getting at the front of that line. It takes initiative, you have to want it. And she's wanted it from day one. They ask me what do I do. I tell them that I was showing goats. And most people think I roped them, but I tell them that I groomed them and walked them and positioned them. And I enjoy being their friends. I raise and show dairy goats, and whenever I met them, they were ready to raise and show dairy goats. Peyton's grandfather come to me and talked to me about getting his granddaughter into agriculture, and I told him that, let's do it. You know, it's nothing to it but to do it. 
and she's done really well with that. Once I bought the goat, her and her dad decided they wanted to show the goat. And I said, show the goat? I said, I, I don't know. She said, well, I'd I like to show him, granddaddy. I said, well, okay. We'll see about it. And of course, we went to the forest people and found out that they do show goats. And then we always have to know all the parts to the goat, from the muzzle to the tail. As I was getting with Miss Deidre, and Miss Deidre worked with her on showing and, and the procedure and methods of showing. My granddaughter, she's, she's very sharp. She, she learns very, very well. And uh, we try to teach her the right way and try to teach her to do it the right way every time. Now you want to put this front leg straight down, make it straight down. Miss Deidre, she showed me how to clip them. She showed me how to wash them. She showed me how to maneuver them around us. That's right. Give me a high five. That's good. When I prepare the goats for the shows, I have to make sure that they stay fed. But it doesn't matter how big their stomachs are. It depends on the udder. So they have to have enough milk in their udder. That's how they mostly win. And then I also walk them around so they don't know how it feels to walk around the pen. And I also have to keep them brushed and washed. I always go upwards. And then once you go upwards, then brush. Upwards, brush, upwards, brush. From the very first show that she ever did, she placed second in showmanship in a matter of five minutes of her doing it, you know, from the very first time. And of course, a lot of that came from prepping with Deidre and her daughter, Tori. And um, we had some of the extension personnel come down and do, you know, just, just teaching and, you know, helping them to learn in the process. And it, it, it all paid off. Parents can't do it for them. When they're out in that show ring, it's that kid, that goat, and that judge, and it's up to them. And they have to know all the parts, That's right. all the breeds. I mean, it's a lot of things that they have got to know to get that first place position. But whenever you're eight or nine years old and you get this first place for showmanship, showmanship is seeing how good you do. Not how do you know how many total you have? No, I don't. It's a bunch. Yeah. I know I have three big ribbons in a plate in the middle. On my first show, I got second place in showmanship. So it felt good to see how when you put your best effort forward, then you'll bring something in return. From the very beginning, she kind of just grabbed onto it and ran with it. So from there, it's kind of where we are now. <laughs> we have Alpine, we have Taco Burger, we have St. Nice, we have a variety of them now. You know more about goats than you ever thought that you would. More than I ever wanted to know. I, I know way more than I need to know about goats at this point. <laughs> so at every single event, whether it's a clinic or it's a show, her family supports her 100%. They're cheering her on, they're holding her animals, they're helping her clean her animals, feed, water, whatever it is Peyton needs, they're there to support her for that. Everybody that you see here now, and it's usually my mom and dad as well, and then sometimes her uncle will come. It actually is, we have this many people everywhere we go. We really do. It is a family affair. We have, we're her little goat village. <laughs> it means a lot to me that they support me. Because most of my family supports me no matter what, even if it was goats or anything. So that makes me feel good to know that they care. I wholeheartedly appreciate the 4-H, the extension program, the whole process because she's pretty much growing up before my eyes every day. So I live for it. I, I, I always want to see her smile. And then she's really, really, really independent and she learns and does things a lot on her own. What would you say the one characteristic maybe that has improved in you through this? I mean, there's a lot of things. Responsibility. I value the extension in the livestock program because our kids need direction. Our kids need values. I mean, you can't go wrong whenever you're teaching them work and responsibility. And I mean, that's, that's what life is all about. The greatest aspect about the livestock project is we're not just creating kids that can go out there and show an animal in the ring. We're creating 
leaders, kids that can be successful and create a really bright future. It's just a very proud moment. She's gonna go somewhere. She's gonna be somebody. Earlier we introduced you to Michael Riso in the beginning of To Better Our Community, part of our original series on land conservation in the Gulf States. In the conclusion, Riso and others look closer at the balancing act between development and conservation. Riso says it's all about being deliberate. I think all cities ought to be uh, taking a very intentional approach to conservation and green space in general. I would say the relationship between land conservation and stormwater management is that water has to go somewhere, right? And so um, one of the best things we can do is preserve and protect areas of land that we shouldn't be building on. You see properties flooding that never have before. Some of that is seawater rise, global warming and all of that, but a huge part of that is 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 years worth of development where we didn't understand the need to incorporate conservation methods. The land that is most suited for conservation are the ones that either shouldn't be developed on because they're in flood areas, they have um, a lot of, they provide a lot of ecosystem services. So in terms of being critical habitat and filtering the water, being holding areas for stormwater, so it's gonna take pressure off our um, municipal stormwater systems. So if you can, let's say, slow the flow <laughs> um, and you know, allow you to filter the water and store the water north, then obviously there's gonna be less flooding south. In any city, when there's development or potential development, you've got to have regulations. There's got to be a process. We've got to take a very intentional and concentrated effort in making sure when they do come to town that they build right so that they don't negatively impact their neighbors. The more conservation methods that we can incorporate into a development as it's being done, the less fixing we have to do later where it impacts another property or even the same property. In working with Diamond Head over the years in watershed planning, they are really taking an interest and a lead in promoting and looking at low impact development practices and really seeing the benefit of preserving some of their greenway corridors uh, and buffers on their waterways. One thing we are trying to do in Diamond Head is to encourage developers to use low impact development. Um, so we have you know, put things in our building code and our ordinances that give them the freedom to have that choice. If they want to use those techniques, they can. One thing I've learned as city manager is that engineers and drainage projects cost a lot of money. So in my opinion, we want to prevent future problems by developing right from the beginning. If you can do things that hold water on your site and let it soak into the ground, you keep your trees healthy, you keep your groundwater healthy, you keep all of your community healthy because you're maintaining the hydrology that used to exist. So right down to the individual property at a house level, it's important. Since the 1990s, we've been talking about clustered development. Development that provides greater intensity, maybe smaller lot sizes, maybe you know increased sort of multifamily kinds of uses in certain areas, but then preserves other areas for nature to provide that same kind of stormwater detention capacity, yes, but other ecosystem services as well. I think that a lot of people in today's world are looking for outdoor activities, things to enjoy, the beauty of having a park or a green space, or taking your class to go sit up under a tree and, and, and have a, a program. We'd all like to do it the um, most economically feasible way, the way that takes care of the land and makes it all a more pleasant place to live because at the end of the day, that draws people to the community. Incorporating land conservation is a challenge because it's change. Change is always uncomfortable. I think what's important is figuring out how to understand an entire area as a whole, incorporate all the stakeholders, make sure people get a chance to express their concerns. 
We have residents that are very much into being more pro-conservation, and we have others who are pro-development. Uh, so there's got to be a nice balancing act. Just incorporating stormwater management plans and ordinances that help manage water and help manage land in an incremental basis is making a big difference in changing the way that land has been developed over the past 50 years, and I think those are hugely important. My kids and their kids are going to benefit if we make those decisions today. Uh, so I think the future is bright. I love Diamond Head. It's, it's a great place to live. I love the people. It's an active community. Whether you're young or old, people are outside having fun. And we just want to make it better. Always a challenge balancing conservation and development. More than ever, the public keeping a keen eye on how land is used and how expansion happens. If you'd like to know more, you can contact the Partnership for Gulf Coast Land Conservation at gulfpartnership.org. It's a coalition of 26 conservation groups that work in the Gulf Coast region. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.